Well, good morning and welcome to our morning service. We give a particularly warm welcome to uh, our speaker this morning, John Burney from Slavic Gospel Association, which we hope to hear from later on in the service. And we ask that the Lord's blessing would be upon uh, his message to us this morning. But before that, we're going to begin our worship by singing in Psalm 100 on page 362. Psalm 100 on page 362. From the beginning of the psalm, all people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Whom serve with mirth his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. Know that the Lord is God indeed, without our aid he did us make. We are his flock, he doth us feed, and for his sheep he doth us take. The whole of the psalm will stand to sing. in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, as we seek to draw near to you this morning, we're aware that we're seeking to draw near to the God who is high and lifted up. You're the God who far surpasses anything that we could even begin to imagine concerning you, concerning your power, because you're the God who is all-powerful. You're in control of all the situations that happen in heaven and on earth. And we bow down, O Lord, in your presence, seeking that you would use that power to make us willing so that we might be reconciled to you because we know that the power that you bestowed upon us in our creation, that we abuse that power to rebel against you, so help us, O Lord, to acknowledge our sin, 
in abusing the privilege that you bestowed upon us by giving us any power. And help us, O oh Lord, that we would now bow down in your presence and be reconciled to you, seeking that you would seek to use your power to influence us so that our minds may be enlightened in the knowledge of who you are, so that our lives may be governed by the power of your Spirit who is able to lead us and guide us in a way that our lives would be to your glory and would be to our own eternal benefit. We bow down in the presence of the one who is ever present, regardless of where we might want to go and regardless of how much we would seek to convince ourselves of your non-existence. Yet, O oh Lord, we are reminded continually through the work of your creation and through the providences that you've allotted to us, that you're the God who is present everywhere. But although you're present everywhere, we haven't by nature got the ability to discern your presence. And we're asking, O oh Lord, for that discernment, so that we would recognize you in our midst, and that we would not fear because we're still here on mercy's ground. You didn't send your son into this world to judge us. You sent your son into this world to save us. So as we seek to draw near to you, we expect that you will deal with us in the way that you've revealed that you want to deal with us in your mercy. And we throw ourselves wholly at your mercy, knowing that you're the God who knows all things that there is to know about us. There is nothing hidden from your eyes. And we would ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us to realize that so that there's no point in seeking to try and deceive you. There's no need for us to try and uh, dress ourselves up with our own righteousness because your word and your spirit has convinced us that it would be futile to do so because our best righteousnesses are as filthy rags. No, O oh Lord, we would seek to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, because we know that that's the only way of access into your presence, because you're the God who has not changed, even although you are merciful to sinners. You are still a holy God, and you're the God who cannot in any way excuse sin or the sinners that commit them. And the only way of access into your presence is under the shelter of the blood that made atonement for our sins and made it possible for us to be reconciled to yourself. So we're asking, O oh Lord, that as we meet here together this morning, that you would help us to bow down and acknowledge you and that you would help us to worship you. We remember the various needs that we have that we're aware of in our own midst, and we bring these things before you, those that are hospitalized, those who are in homes, those who are grieving over the loss of loved ones. We now have two families who have suddenly lost their sons, parents still alive, and their children being taken into eternity. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased to bless these parents, and that you would draw near to them to comfort them, and that you would bless the siblings that have been bereft of brothers. We ask, Lord, that you would be merciful towards them and that you would reveal yourself to them as the friend that sticks closer than any brother. Lord, we would commit these families to your care. And the things that we're aware of in our own midst, we know that it's common to all of mankind. So we wouldn't confine our prayers to our own congregation or our own community. We would seek that you would, in your mercy, hear the prayers of your people throughout the world. That you would, in your mercy, continue to bring forth your own kingdom that you would continue to raise up those that will go forth to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that respect, we pray for our 
visiting preacher this morning, John Burney, and for the work that he's associated with, with the Slavic Gospel Association. We commit that organization to you as those who have gone out into the great harvest field. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless every endeavor that they make and every missionary endeavor that is made throughout the world to reach this world for Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that your kingdom would continue to come, that we would see sinners flocking into it, and that we would see the kingdom of heaven being taken by storm. Lord, we ask that you would lead us and go before us to these ends, that you would hear and answer the prayers of your people, having mercy upon us for our sins and shortcomings. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, it's uh, nice to see some of the children back with us this week. And I'm going to hold something up and I'm going to ask if you know what it might be or what I might use it for. Who's going to tell me? Yes, down there. Sorry? Ah, I'm not hearing you, but I'm quite sure you've got the right answer. It's a key. Is that what you said it was? It's the key to my car. <laughs> now, that's a very useful little thing to have. Because just recently, I jumped into my car and I put my hands in my pockets and I couldn't find it. I jumped out of the car and went through my pockets and I couldn't find it. Now, there was nothing wrong with the car. It didn't have a flat tire. There was plenty of petrol in the tank. I knew that the engine had been running perfectly uh, the last time I had used it. But I also knew that unless I had this little key, that car was as good as useless. Because that's what's going to enable me to get into the power that that car has so that it would take me where I wanted to go. Eventually, I did find the key. I had put it into my jacket pocket, but before I had got into the car, I had thrown my jacket onto the back seat. So the key was there, but even though it was close at hand, it was of no use until I actually put it into the socket and turned it. And in many respects, that's how prayer is. We can have a religion and it looks great on the outside. We can read our Bibles, come to church, and as far as we know, everything that's been done in church is done the way it should be done. But unless God blesses us going to church and his own word to us, then we won't experience the power of God in our hearts. And in order to experience the power of God in our hearts, we need to do one simple thing. We need to pray to him. And we need to ask him to help us. Because although everything else might look fine, unless God blesses us, and comes into our hearts in power, then we're not going to go any further forward in our spiritual lives. So we need to pray. Just as I need the key to start my car, to unleash the power, we need to pray to God so that he would unleash his power. So let's just join together and do that now. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, we acknowledge that although everything that we do might appear to be what we ought to do, it might appear to be to your glory, we're reading your word, and even as we go to Sunday school, the teachers will tell us and explain to us what your word means. But unless you bless that to us. Unless you come into our hearts 
to shape us by your word and to conform us to the image of Christ, then it will have been of no benefit to us whatsoever. So help us, O Lord, to be encouraged to pray to you and to come to you just as we are. We don't need to come with big fancy words. You understand us in whatever words we're able to use to try and tell you what we're seeking. So help us, O Lord, to come as we are, knowing that Jesus will present us to you and be pleased to bless us, not because we think we earn it, but because we believe that you want to give it to us. And we're asking that you would do so for your own glory and for our benefit. Lead us to these ends, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again. This time we're going to sing in Psalm 96a on page 127. And after we sing, the children will go to Sunday school and John will then take over the rest of the service. So Psalm 96a on page 127. And we're going to sing from verse 7. All nations to the Lord ascribe the glory that is due. Glory and strength ascribe to God and praise his name anew. Enter his courts with joy and bring an offering with you. Worship the Lord in holy fear. All earth before him bow. Down to the end of the psalm. All nations to the Lord ascribe the glory that is true.
Well, it's a great joy for me to be with you here this morning in Garabost. I was here, I think, once before. I, I would have to consult my diaries uh, to see when it was, but it's certainly, I think, about 10 years ago or, or more, I remember being uh, here. But a delight to be here today. I thank you for your welcome, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you something of what God has been doing um, through SGA uh, in uh, uh, recent years, particularly these recent troubled years, and uh, also to focus our mind a little bit on Ukraine. I'd like to spend just a, a few moments of that report telling you a little bit about uh, what's happening in Ukraine with our own missionaries and, and uh, workers uh, in the land and indeed on the borders of that. So uh, before I, I do anything else, perhaps I should mention the, the book stall just at the front of the church here and uh, there is some free literature this is our uh, front lines magazine uh, which uh, brings you up to date really once every couple of months uh, if you don't get it and would like to have it uh, please take one and you can phone the office or email them or or uh, write to them and they'll be happy to send that out to you there are also other project leaflets there uh, uh, telling of some of the work that we're involved in and there's one little booklet uh, which i think is uh, uh, very useful. It's a little prayer matters booklet, 31 uh, days, uh, a day, a prayer topic, a day for a month. And uh, if you want to follow the work of SGA, and not just the SGA's work, but work in Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Far East Russia, you can use this little book, really. It will focus your prayers from day to day. Um, and there are, there's other free literature there. Um, some uh, books that are there and uh, don't worry about paying today if you haven't got money or, or and, and don't want to pay today. Please uh, just take the books and you can pay later and, and the church will forward the money uh, to SGA. This is a book designed really for 10 to 14 year olds. Uh, it's uh, called Peter. It's a story of uh, Peter Dynica or Peter Dynamite as he came, became known, uh, the founder of SGA's mission. And uh, it really is a wonderful story of God's grace in a, a young person's life. And then we have a special offer, uh, uh, and uh, the books are on the table, and I have more in the car uh, as well, so don't be afraid. There are three books here. One is on 25 years of our work in Moldova. Uh, amazing work, how it grew from so little uh, to uh, the work that it is today, Bible teaching, church planting, supporting missionaries, uh, helping them with buildings and with transport and all kinds of things. And uh, it's a, a truly a, a, a story of God's grace. This is a little book called Casa Philippe. Sorry, this uh, ought to sell at three pounds. This Casa Philippe is a story of a, a young couple uh, who were dedicated to God's work in Romania. And uh, the husband, Philip, contracted brain cancer and he died at 36. Um, his uh, wife, Violetta, uh, in fact, both of them uh, in his dying months in hospital, became very conscious of the fact that many cancer patients and that many relatives of cancer patients could not afford to stay in accommodation in Cluj uh, because it was just too expensive for them um, and, and they weren't able to do that. And so the, the vision was born of a, uh, a house accommodation, uh, free or very cheap for people who would come to visit their patients. And it's turned into a wonderful ministry. People have... Uh, been converted really through the witness and the testimony of that place, Casa Philippe. Violetta tells a little bit of the story herself and uh, the rest of it I have set in, a, in, in its context. Then this is a book of um, testimonies from Central Asia, most of them from a Muslim background or from a, a, a pagan background, Brahmism and black magic and so forth, and people who have been converted and then who have been discipled, who have been helped, particularly by a a Bible correspondence course which we sponsor uh, called the uh, Independent Bible Correspondence Course. We, we uh, support it through our mission partners in Central Asia, Bible Mission, and uh, there are some wonderful stories here of uh, men and women who have been brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The three books should cost eight pounds, but our mission director, Derek Maxwell, is very generous at the moment, and he's offering the three of them for five. 
So three books for five pounds. I think that's a good bargain, and uh, you'll not get it, I think, anywhere else. So those are there. Please help yourself. And I do have more literature in the car. If, um, if we run out there, uh, please uh, look and, and take what you want. Well, it's a joy to uh, be with you today. I'm going to give a report and, to, and, and share the Word of God. And so, in preparation for coming around the Word of God later, I want us to read together uh, from the Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to dip in, really, to um, three little stories, three little snapshots, if you like, uh, of the record that Luke gives us here uh, in uh, his writing. So we're, we're starting at, at, at Luke chapter 12. Uh, sorry, Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison. And delivering over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him is made by the church. Now, uh, the, the story goes on, and we, we, we join it again in verse 20 of that chapter. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. In the next chapter, Barnabas and Saul are sent off on a missionary journey, and we, we uh, read in verse 4 of chapter 13, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the, pro the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit, and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you'll be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went by seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And uh, then we, uh, we move into uh, further down into chapter 13, and uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, have moved to the city in Antioch, and they've preached uh, in the, uh, the temple grounds, and there's been a tremendous move, really, amongst the people. And, uh, and we read then in verse 42, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. 
For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout woman of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We praise God for his word and the record that he has left us of his people in those ancient days. Now we're going to sing again uh, before we come to the report and the preaching of the word and our psalm this time is Psalm 78 uh, on page 101, Psalm 78 and we are going to sing verses 1 to 6. Psalm 78, O my people, hear my teaching, parables I will unfold. Give attention as I utter dark and hidden things of old. Things that we have heard and known by our fathers they were shown. We will tell them to our children, generations yet to come. We will show the Lord's great power and the wonders he has done. Laws for Israel he made, statutes firm to be obeyed. Verses 1 to 6 of Psalm 78, please. We are so deeply indebted to you, God's people, for your prayers and your support and your interest in the work of SGA. Slavic Gospel Association in the UK is now 72 years old, and uh, we uh, were planning to celebrate our 70th birthday, as it were, uh, in uh, 2020 with all kinds of meetings, and we had lots of plans to do this and that throughout the, the whole country. And then, of course, um, you know what happened. Uh, our friend COVID-19 intervened and all sorts of things were thrown up in the air. And for us as a mission, it was a, 
really it was a time uh, of anxiety, if I'm honest with you, and uncertainty, because we weren't able to get out around the churches to share uh, the, the burden of the mission and the, the vision that we have uh, in the mission. We weren't able to visit the, the fields to teach in our uh, Bible schools and to maintain our contact with the folk uh, in the various countries in which we work. And so we, we, had, uh, we had lots of questions in our minds. We had some projects planned. One of the projects was what we call Project 70. And we were asking God for 70 additional missionaries, 70 additional missionaries to work throughout the uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Central Asia, and Far East Russia, where SGA uh, is at work. And of course, it was a very ambitious uh, uh, desire and plan in the first place. But when COVID came, we thought, well, uh, you know, humanly speaking, this is impossible. You know, God didn't give us 70 uh, evangelists. He gave us 80, 80 additional evangelists. And he gave us the uh, finance to uh, finance most of these missionary and missionary families in the various parts of the world. So we're so thankful to God that in that respect, the work did not go back. The work, in fact, moved forward. Many of you will know of our uh, uh, humanitarian work, particularly amongst uh, widows and orphans. Our widows project has been going for many years now, based on that uh, quotation from Job, making the widow's heart sing for joy. And uh, each Christmas, um, many hundreds of widows in different parts of the fields in which we work receive a little gift to uh, help them through the winter months. And uh, usually we have been sending out, uh, around November time, we've been sending out 40 to 40 to 50, 45,000 uh, pounds and uh, that goes and it's distributed by the pastors and the elders of the various churches uh, in, in the countries in which uh, we work. It's a tremendous help to believing widows but also a, a great witness to unbelieving wit widows who live around the churches and they are helped as well and many of them have been brought to faith through this um, uh, ministry uh, to uh, the widows. Well, in our COVID year, if you want to put it like that, we were able to send out £70,000 for the work of the widows. And that was such a tremendous blessing, really, for them in the, the great need in which they found themselves. So in that respect, uh, also, uh, the work of God moved forward. Also, in our uh, biblical leadership training and our training of leaders, we, we were not able to travel to the schools to teach Usually, uh, in years gone by, I have been traveling, for example, maybe five or six times a year, once every couple of months, to a school here or one there, and, uh, and teaching. And uh, we weren't able to do that. So we thought, what's going to happen? Well, we tried teaching by Zoom uh, once or twice, not very uh, successful, particularly when you have to work through a translator. So uh, you know what it's like. Some of you have been on Zoom, and it's quite difficult, really. Um, but what did happen was God answered our prayers in a, in a wonderful way. For years, we have been trying to encourage national pastors and national teachers to come forward, to step up to the mark and to teach their own people. But they wouldn't do it. They were very reluctant because SGA teachers were on hand and they were able to do it and they were happy to let us do it. When COVID came, we couldn't go out. So they had to step up to the mark. And so God moved the work forward in this way so that there are a number of national teachers now who are involved along with us in teaching in the mission schools. For example, in Poland, that has happened. In, in Moldova, uh, in the, the, the school in Belts, that has happened. And in, in that school in Moldova, we have just seen our 15th group of students commence their studies for two years. Um, and that, that's a, a tremendous encouragement to us because it means that really well over 300 uh, of our graduates have come out to work in the churches in North Moldova. And God has blessed in that way. So in our biblical leadership training, um, the work did not go backwards. The work actually also went forward. And, and you know, as we look at each aspect of our work, our leadership training, our leadership support, whereby we uh, uh, help with transport and with houses of prayer and with regular financial giving, um, to many uh, of our missionaries in uh, Eastern Europe. We now are supporting, I think, over 200 uh, missionaries and pastors um, in the various countries. Um, that has 
has, has been maintained, and not just maintained, but indeed it has accelerated too. And God really has, I think, surprised us. Maybe uh, we should be ashamed at our lack of faith, um, but God has surprised and delighted us by moving um, all of this work forward. Well, please continue to pray for those ongoing ministries. Those are things that happen. Uh, Christian literature, for example, we have just in the past uh, couple of years produced uh, Bibles in the Uzbek, in the Kazakh, and in the Tajik languages. Uh, not just Bibles for adults, <clears throat> but also children's Bibles. And, and the, the, the project will deliver or will mean that a, a, a children's Bible and an adult Bible are delivered to many homes. The idea is that these packs will go out to uh, local churches and the believers in the local churches will then distribute them to four families that they've prayed for uh, and, and, uh, and that they're praying that God will work in their lives. And so in that way, we uh, plan to see the word of God spreading. Also, there's a project which is very interesting called Sending Little Missionaries. You can find out about these uh, on the website. And the little missionaries are radios. And we're in, uh, in uh, conjunction with Transworld Radio, working particularly in Central Asia, sending little radios and pre-programmed SD cards into parts of Central Asia that missionaries themselves cannot reach. And God has blessed that work. Initially, SGA uh, had uh, covenant to, to, covenanted to purchase 500 of these. The figure is now over 1,500, and we've been able to send these in. And, you know, we've had wonderful testimonies back. We had a testimony from a lady, for example, who... who uh, whose husband is a, a Muslim, and uh, she says that if he, if he knew that she was uh, a believer, he would kill her. If he knew that she was listening to these broadcasts, he would kill her. But she's able to do it with a little radio and a little SD card. She's able to listen in secret and be taught uh, uh, the word of God. So these things are bringing much blessing, and we're thankful to God for them. And please, I ask you to uh, keep up to date and keep praying for those. Um, what about Ukraine? Well, you know, the war in Ukraine um, did not commence three months ago. The war in Ukraine commenced uh, in 2014, eight years ago, when Crimea was annexed and when the militants in uh, eastern uh, Ukraine, in the Donbass area, who have come to, it now began to agitate and violence broke out. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in the eight years before the present conflict, in the eight years before the present outbreak of conflict, over 14,000 people lost their lives. And tens of thousands of people were displaced from their homes in East Ukraine, had to flee into the West or need to cross borders into other countries. This war has been going on for a long time. And SGA have been in there from the very beginning. From those, that initial outbreak, um, we were there helping with hum humanitarian aid. We, we sent out, for example, thermal clothing and, uh, and other warm clothing. We or, or purchased it. Uh, uh, we purchased uh, thermal heaters, um, panel heaters, even electric kettles, things that would make life uh, easier and better for the folk uh, out there who were suffering um, so greatly. Now the conflict, of course, has envelop the whole land. And uh, we have 35 missionary couples working in Ukraine. And uh, many of them, well, eight, I think 10 of them, were working in the red zone across in the east of Ukraine in the heat of the conflict. And uh, many of them stayed and have stayed up until the last moment. Uh, and uh, even those that have been driven out by the conflict, when the Russians withdrew a little, they have come back uh, into it. And we have many, many stories of, of uh, God at work in the lives of folk there. We, we, we heard of a, an 80-year-old retired surgeon who trusted the Lord in the middle of the conflict. We know of six men in Irpin, and you've probably heard of Irpin being uh, mentioned on the, on the news. Six men in Irpin um, trusting the Lord and, and giving public testimony. Uh, again, a couple more in Odessa. Uh, so God is at work. And, and the report that we're getting back from the leaders uh, in uh, Ukraine, those who are associated with us, 
is that they have never known such a hunger for God since the time when the Soviet Union broke up and the Iron Curtain fell. Um, and they say there is a hunger for God and an openness to the gospel now which is unprecedented in the last 30 years or so. So we're thankful for that. What is SGA doing? Well, providentially we were ideally placed, as it were, to help. Because in all of the surrounding countries, Poland, Hungary, Romania, um, uh, Moldova, uh, and Slovakia, we have missionaries at work. And they're at work, some of them, in churches which are on the borders. And so as soon as this conflict uh, um, um, grew and, and, uh, and became very fierce, they immediately got to the borders and began to minister to the folk there. And what SGA have been doing is we, we don't send out material. What we do is we send out finance. And the finance goes out to trusted leaders, men uh, whom we have known for many years. They uh, distribute this. They buy the goods that are needed, uh, the relief supplies, and they find ways and means of getting those relief supplies, not just to the refugees outside of Ukraine on the borders, but also continuing to get those relief supplies into Ukraine. I just mentioned one example, a man called Daniel Christen in Poland. And Daniel's church, he motivated the church and indeed uh, many of the churches in the region. And uh, he uh, has a, a, a friend uh, called, uh, um, it's not Ivan, I'm trying to get it right, Oleg, I think it is. And he, he is a, a Ukrainian. And, and so between the two of them, they work very well together, able to purchase food, to get it to the border and then um, to get it through the border and into Ukraine and even into some of the most difficult parts of Ukraine. The same is true in Suchava in Romania. The pastor there, who's the reg he's a regional superintendent, if you like, and he has motivated the churches and they put up a tent on the, the border to receive refugees. They opened their church building to make them uh, uh, um, places where they could accommodate those who had nothing. And uh, uh, dear friends, they have maintained a wonderful ministry really to uh, uh, women and children in particular um, uh, as these people have fled the conflict in Ukraine. And you know, God's people have been wonderfully generous. Um, it is amazing how the funds have flooded in. And one of the things that we like to assure people is this, that all of the money that has been donated and will be donated for the work of Ukraine, all of it, uh, every penny will go to that relief. None of it is taken away for administration or anything else. It all goes directly to relieve the needs uh, in Ukraine. We are thankful to God that he is still at work there. But we are also saddened by stories of, um, of the ultimate sacrifice on the part of believers there. Five young men in Mariupol uh, who were trapped in the basement with other folk uh, um, and they were starving. They had no food. So these young men, uh, believers, they decided that they would go and try and get some food. And when they came out, they were confronted by the Russian military and they were shot dead. Another young man, uh, Anatoly, who, who uh, left his wife and his children in a safe place, and he came back to Irpin um, to help those who were still in need. And uh, he was helping a lady and her two little children across a broken bridge. You probably saw the broken bridge in Irpin actually on your, on your television screens, but he was helping them across to catch a bus to get them out of the, uh, the danger zone, and they were shelled, and uh, he was killed, and the lady and her two children were killed as well. So the stories, some of the stories have been very heartbreaking, and uh, uh, particularly for those of us who have, our, uh, have personal friends there, and, and uh, they're there, we are deeply anxious for them but we also trust God that the Lord will bless and protect them and be near to them. And you know, in it all, dear friends, in it all, the Lord is still at work. And this is the wonderful thing. It's, it's hard for us to, to think even how can good come out of all of this evil? You know, how, can, how can anything positive come out of it? But we have a God who's sovereign. We have a God who is able to do above and beyond what we can ever imagine. We have a God who... If you think about it, through the greatest tragedy that ever, ever came about in this world, 
brought the greatest blessing because when they nailed the Son of God to the cross, the greatest crime that men ever could have committed, they were doing God's will. And out of that sacrifice of our Savior on the cross, um, we have salvation offered to those um, who will come and trust him. So God can do this, and we believe that God will do it. And in it all, dear friends, God is indeed sovereign. And that brings us to the Word of God this morning, which I've read to you. Because I think that we see uh, in these passages that we read from Acts of the Apostles something that is very obvious. Um, it was as I was reading through the Acts in my own um, personal uh, readings that, that these thoughts came to me, that where God is at work, the devil is at work. Where the gospel is going forth, it will inevitably uh, be confronted by evil and by wrong. And we see this over and over again in the Acts of the Apostles. As the early church sought to establish a witness and to witness the people, uh, uh, there was opposition and persecution on every hand. And we see it here, actually, in these passages that we've read from this morning. We started off with, with Herod and, uh, and Herod's action uh, against the uh, the apostles and against the church. And I want to say to you this morning, and you can take this little thought home with you and think about it. It's very simple. That neither dictators, deceivers, nor deniers will halt the spread of the gospel or will curb the word of God. The word of God is not bound. And dictators, deceivers, and deniers cannot stop it. Think about dictators. Well, you think of Herod. Herod was the ultimate dictator in that day. Um, he uh, uh, moved against the church, and uh, he, he killed James, as we, as we said, and, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, and he wanted to keep in with them, he was going to do the same with Peter. But God delivered him, and God's power prevailed. And it's interesting, isn't it, that that dictator uh, was brought low that dictator was brought low. God's power prevailed. Foolish Herod set himself in opposition to God, and his pride blinded him to his mortality. And he, he took to himself that which belonged to God alone. He did not give God the glory, Luke tells us here. And with one stroke of judgment, God destroyed this dictator and took him out of the picture. And, and not only that, uh, not only did God's power prevail, but God's word multiplied. And it's interesting, isn't it, as you read that story, uh, that, that uh, all of Herod's opposition did nothing really to curb the spread of the word of God. Look at verse 24 in chapter 12. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And the disciples rejoiced that despite the opposition, the word of God was indeed um, capturing the hearts of men and women. And, and there's a little phrase in verse 25, which I don't think we read together, but uh, this is what it says. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, listen, when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. And one of the things that that reminds us is that God's mission will be accomplished. God's mission, God's work will be done. Um, it would be easy to gloss over that little phrase. But they returned to Antioch when they had done what they wanted to do. The fires of persecution had not deterred them from doing the will of God or for leaving the work of God incomplete. So that's dictators. You think that Putin, with all his might and his power, can hold back the word of God? Can't. But dear friends, at this present time, you'll smile at this. At this present time, in Putin's, at Putin's back door, there are 100,000 Russian Bibles being stored in Moscow to be moved into Central Asia. Why produce Russian Bibles? Well, uh, we produced them in Uzbek and Tajik and so forth. But the common language of Central Asia, for the many smaller ethnic groups into whose language we can't, or haven't the ability to translate into all of those languages, but they all speak Russian. And so those 100,000 Bibles 
will be moved into Central Asia. In fact, some of them have already been moved and, uh, and they'll be read by families there uh, in a language that they can understand. See, uh, no dictator. It doesn't matter whether it's Eastern, Western. We think um, today of North Korea. My wife is greatly burdened for that country and prays for it uh, often. Prays for the downfall of, 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 of that regime and for the ongoing work of the gospel. Well, whether God brings the regime down or not, the work of the gospel will go on. The same in China, the same in Muslim countries where God's people are, are persecuted. Dictators cannot stop God's word. Well, neither can deceivers, because the next passage that we read, the next story we read, was of Barnabas and Saul confronting this man, Elymas. And they had moved uh, really to... to uh, in, uh, to speak to this uh, uh, proconsul Sergius Paulus. We see, if you like, the two figures that are there are Sergius Paulus, who's a, the Bible says he's a man of intelligence. He's a man who wants to hear. He was a searching man, a thinker, drawn to the gospel. Because if you read the account carefully, you'll see that the apostles had already been around the whole island. And so the gospel had been preached around the whole island, and the proconsul heard about it, and he wanted to hear. But Elymas, or Bar-Jesus, as he was called, his name, the name Bar-Jesus uh, literally means the Son of God who saves. But uh, Paul accosted him and said he was nothing of the sort. What he was was a son of the devil, an enemy of all righteousness. And uh, uh, the crime of Elymas, or Bar-Jesus, was not only that he did not believe himself, but he sought to deceive the, uh, the proconsul and to keep him from believing. And so, uh, again, God moves uh, against that man. And he struck blind, whether uh, that blindness was permanent or, in fact, whether it was, it was temporary, we're not sure. But certainly what happened then was the proconsul saw the power of God at work and heard the word of God, and he was uh, converted. It's wonderful to, to read that uh, the proconsul believed, verse 12, astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So deceivers could not stop the impact of the gospel upon that man's life. Dictators couldn't do it. Deceivers couldn't do it. And then we have in chapter 13 an example of what I've called deniers. This was Pisidian Antioch. And as the apostles preached there, God was ple pleased to move in a wonderful way. And people's hearts were stirred. They, they they were moved by the preaching uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that the apostles in those days, they were preaching the gospel from the Old Testament. They were backing it up, if you like, from the Old Testament, the prophecies of the Old Testament, and showing that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Messiah. And the folk were astonished, if you like, by this uh, teaching. And the powerful preaching uh, to these citizens uh, it, it led to a, a citywide clamor for more. You know, you think about it. Imagine if, if uh, as we read here, uh, that, that the whole city uh, turned out the next Sabbath. Imagine if the whole city turned out in Stornoway um, to hear the preaching of the Word of God. How glad our hearts would be. But that's what happened. Uh, we read there in, in, in chapter uh, 13 that they, they begged them, uh, to come back and preach again. And the result was the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And of course, that stirred up jealousy and hate in the hearts of the Jews in particular. And when the Jews rejected it, well, the apostles turned to the Gentiles. And they said, well, we'll turn to the Gentiles. We're meant to be a light to the Gentiles. And we read that the Gentiles rejoiced, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, there was a harvest amongst those Gentiles as the word of God was preached. Well, what did the deniers do? They stirred up opposition. The prominent women in the city and the prominent men, and they, they stirred them up in such a way that the apostles were uh, cast out of the city. They were expelled from the city. And what they did was, well, we read that they, they shook the dis, dust from off their feet against them and went on to Iconium. But you see the last verse, what it says there in chapter 13, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Why? 
they, 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 I'm sure they didn't rejoice at, 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 at being accosted and persecuted and afflicted and so forth in that sense, but they rejoiced in this, that all of that opposition and persecution could not stop the progress of the Word of God, touching the hearts of Gentiles and indeed Jews alike. And they left behind them, as they left the city in Antioch, they left behind a believing church, people who had truly trusted the Lord and the kingdom of Jesus Christ extending in that place. Dear friends, we are apt always to look at circumstances around us, aren't we? And our eyes very often, very often they, they fall from where they should be, uh, a look of faith to God and, and trust in Him. And we begin, like the Apostle Peter, when, he, when he, he looked at the waves rather than looking at Christ and began to sink, you know, we often lower our gaze and, uh, and, and our faith is weakened. We need to keep our eyes on Him and remember that He is indeed King. We sang today from one of our psalms, one of our singings, that the Lord reigns, and He does, the Lord reigns. And he's still on the throne today. It's not Joe Biden and it's not Vladimir Putin and it's not any other leader in the world. The Lord is king. He is Lord of all. And the Lord is working out his perfect purpose in our world. We don't know how. It's mysterious to us. We cannot see or understand many of the things that happen. But as believers, we trust him because we know that the Lord does all things well. So I hope that you'll be encouraged today. You know, all the opposition that the devil can throw at us as the people of God and as the church of Christ, it will fall to the ground ultimately because the word of God will prevail. And as our Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. May the Lord bless you and bless his word to your heart today. We are going to um, close by singing again uh, psalm 126 it's page 171 uh, in your uh, psalter uh, page 171 and we'll finish uh, with psalm 126 i love this you know i i think i first learned to sing this uh here in lewis many years ago and it's become one of my favorite psalms um, because it does it does encourage us uh, with regard to the word of god and the sowing of that word in the hearts of men and women. When Zion's fortunes God restored, it was a dream come true. Our mouths were then with laughter filled, our tongues with songs anew. The nation said, the Lord has done great things for Israel. The Lord did mighty things for us, and joy our hearts knew well. Restore our fortunes, gracious Lord, like streams in desert soil. A joyful harvest will reward the weeping sower's toil. The man who bearing seed to sow goes out with tears of grief will come of again with songs of joy bearing his harvest sheaf. Let's stand to sing to God's praise. <laughs>
gracious and eternal God. We thank you for the assurance of these words that we've been singing. The very word of God encouraging us despite the pain, despite the difficulty, despite the tears to go with our indestructible seed of the gospel and to sow it in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls around us. Father, help us to respond to that in these days, to live for your glory, to speak um, faithfully and indeed courageously for the Lord Jesus Christ and to sow the seed where we have the opportunity. And now, Father, we pray that your blessing, the blessing of the eternal God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be ours today and every day until Jesus comes. Amen.